But that makes I mean, if you had dispatch.com, think about that. Like nowadays, if you own yeah, that, that, that's so that, sick. That would be <laughs> worth so much money. I mean, good luck. We're still dreaming of buying them out. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. Uh, Bring me the bad word. I appreciate you guys doing this. So this podcast is all about you and your journey in music, uh, starting Dispatch and uh, the new record. We'll talk about that as well. Right off. Cool, cool. Um, I did read that the band started when you guys were at college, but I'd love to hear how you met and in your previous journeys in music. So Brad, how did you get into music originally? And where were you born and raised actually? Born and raised in Denver, Colorado, and uh, music was just a deep part of, of my family. My grandpa was a singer, my mom and other grandma played piano. So I started singing at a really early age and then got into guitar when I was like 14 or 15 and had a high school band and we were going for it. And then we had a hugely <laughs> dramatic breakup and I said, I'd never be in a band again. And then I met Chad. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that must have been quite the breakup. You didn't want to ever be oh, in again. Dude, oh we goodness. made the most incredible four song cassette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Did you go to school for music or just went to college for something completely different? Went to college, really focused in on playing lacrosse and loved music, but I don't read music. So I just took a couple classes thinking that I wouldn't quite uh, I wouldn't quite make it through uh, being illiterate so to speak but it was a teeny school so there was a woman there one of my teachers who was like you should just follow this through and we'll teach you how to compose and write for people but you can keep working by ear wow that's pretty incredible that they were able to like you know compensate for you yeah there were six of us in that uh in the music major so uh, five were really great at reading and they couldn't stand the idea of improvising and i couldn't stand the idea of reading and only improvise so we were a good mix <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. What about you, Chad? Where were you born and raised? Uh, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. And, and uh, on a little farm. Um, my dad and, 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 and grandmother both play the piano. And so that was always happening um, in my house. And my dad sings a bit. So uh, and then I just I started playing trombone in fourth grade. Uh, and we also lived with my uncle who played the tuba. Um, so cool. <laughs> we had some good low brass going because then my brothers, yeah, my brothers, two of my brothers play the trumpet and trombone as well. So, oh, wow. Um, and then I started playing guitar in junior high and, and was in some ska bands with the trombone and, and also played some guitar. And, I, um, and then, uh, when I, when I first got to school, to college, uh, I met one of our other bandmate who's no longer in the band. Uh, Pete was playing at my February orientation in a band. Oh. And I asked him if he needed any trombone players. And that was the beginning of... Uh, of um, of oh, Hermit Thrush. Hermit Thrush. And then eventually... Of Hermit Thrush. Hermit Thrush, our first band. And then Finding Brad and then... And then Brad, Pete, and I uh, kicking it together. Okay. I mean, amazing. I went to a Hermit Thrush show and I was blown away. And I was like, gosh, I mean, could I rock like this again? Could I? <laughs> and, you know, and then there was major drama there too, Chad. I mean, Pete was in Hermit Thrush and was also an acoustic indigo boy with me. And then somehow we formed the super group of Brad, Chad, and Pete. <laughs> oh, so you so you ended up getting in a band then, Brad, before uh like I wouldn't like, call it a band, Adam. <laughs> yeah, Come on, cool. bro. We were Come rocking on. the gamut room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just a couple yeah. guys in their acoustic guitars singing. Hard That's music. right. That's right. Okay. For the love of the game. Sure, sure. Well, when did you guys decide to form dispatch then? Well, he really did pull on both of us in that way. It was just yeah. like, we, you guys have got to meet each other. I was like, really? We want a third guitar player and third singer and third songwriter? That sounds fun. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it ended up working out great. And, and I, I can't speak to what happened in the dissolution of Hermit Thrush. I'll leave that to my esteemed yeah. associate. Yeah. Well, I, I will say that Brad was hesitant, you know, but I was, I was excited to play with Brad. But, you know, 
I can see where he, he Brad was very protective of what he had going on. And I think, I'm not sure I saw uh, really long legs in the hermit thrush uh, trajectory. Um, and I, I could hear Brad sing, you know, I could, I could, when Brad and Pete sang, um, you could tell Brad was a savant, harmony savant. And I was like, I would love to sing with that guy. So I was, I was, I was excited to get it together. And, it, and even the first time we sang together, it was, it, it, it was awesome. I mean, it was, it felt like, it felt like we had a, a good blend. Okay. That's amazing. And then that's kind of what, when you started really working together and realizing, oh, this is a thing, that's when you decided to really form the band? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And did you start playing around the college area? Or what, what was the first movie you made? We, we had Chad's uh, sister Farley was at Duke and our good buddy Ryan D'Agostino was our quote manager. And we took a suburban on tour and went down and played the Cosmic Cantina for organic burritos. It was burritos. an amazing paycheck. Oh, um, that is a paycheck. But we did. Though. That's awesome. It was pretty sweet. I mean, being in the Northeast, there were so many prep schools and colleges and friends that were, we played a show at Dartmouth through some friends and started feeling like we're kind of, you know, stretching our legs a little bit. But a lot of it was just, just like basements of dorms on campus in the beginning. And then, and then we branched out to a, a pub in Burlington called RJ's. Oh, that's right. And, Crazy Johnny Levy. Yeah. And so we, and we were always recording our shows, you know, um, and, and I don't know, uh, you know, and uh, web, websites were just starting to, <laughs> <laughs> we, I remember we hired like our friend Taylor or something to. No, we didn't hire him. It was a senior project. To make a, oh, a wow. website. And we were like a web what? <laughs> why would we need that yeah sure. you're so techy whatever dude and then we figured out there was another band we were one fell swoop first and when chad and pete and i went to like check out taylor's website we found uh-oh another band in st louis called one fell swoop oh. and and as everybody knows that was such a huge drawn out deal <laughs> major success story <laughs> <laughs> we got a cease and desist letter from this country reggae band in st louis saying they'd played with it first and then we became dispatched that's funny so they actually found you and and sent a cease and desist so it wasn't like oh there's already a band let's no. change yeah they, <laughs> oh, they read us, read us. <laughs> they, yeah they sent us the cease and desist oh man that's hilarious did you guys i would have kept that Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I would have kept that. That's so I just good. found some one fell swoop shirts. I found yeah, some OFS shirts. We've kept a lot over the years. It's kind of buried in our past, but, but sure. we, we didn't throw away much. That's funny. Yeah. So then then the birth of dispatch due to the the season assist letter. Yes. Yeah, but then we learned that websites were not so easy to come by, and Dispatch.com was a newspaper in St. Louis. Gosh, a lot of St. Louis. Chad. Columbus, no, Columbus. <laughs> Columbus. Columbus. Okay. Yeah, Columbus. So we're DispatchMusic.com. Okay. Then that. Oh, so you had to go with Dispatch. But that makes. I mean, if you had dispatch.com, think about that. Like nowadays, if you own yeah, that, no. that's so that, sick. That would be <laughs> worth so much money. I mean, good luck. We're Lord. still dreaming of buying them out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So now you have a website, and you, did you have a demo at this point? Yeah, we had demo. We had cassette demos pretty, uh, pretty early on, and then in, and then we went out on our. Pretty early on, we 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 drove our uh, Volkswagen bus out uh, from East Coast to West Coast or East Coast to Denver to record oh, wow. our, first, our first album, um, which uh, was on a CD, and uh, we recorded it in a graveyard shift. We recorded it from like 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Why did we do that, Chad? <laughs> oops brad brad is generally very organized and, right. uh, and unless it involves a calendar and detail oriented and and, and and he used to have this like fat um day timer oh day timer yeah it's like a trapper keeper for organization for all like because okay. we were booking ourselves and stuff so we'd have everyone's phone numbers in there we'd call you know we'd set up like a rolodex type thing oh dude like a big a fat 
Yeah. Velcro Trapper Keeper Binder. It's okay. Awesome. <laughs> we call people every day for hours Andrew Stahl. trying to get yeah. gigs. And uh, but it was super helpful once once we got some shit recorded, you know, and then we were just like selling CDs at shows and telling people to burn CDs and mm -hmm. um just like uh it, it was great. And then Napster hit, you know, not too long after that, probably after after we'd done our second record, you know, the following year. Mm -hmm. um napster really poured flames on everything and or poured gasoline on on what on what on the campfire that was already cooking and then and, and that really helped as well oh so napster actually helped you guys as a band big time big interesting time. interesting okay, well i want to back up just for a second so uh, why <laughs> so you guys had to do a, a graveyard shift on recording that first record yes yeah yeah and between that album and Bang Bang, you guys got signed to Universal Records, right? Uh, no, we, oh. we went we went and recorded Bang Bang Back East. And I think maybe Chad booked that, so it was daytime hours. Um, <laughs> and no, we were still one fell swoop on our first two albums. Yeah. And I think oh. we were, Chad, isn't that, that's the era of when we first saw Wes Anderson's film Bottle Rocket with Owen and Luke Wilson. And we reached out to like the film company and wanted to see if we could incorporate some bottle rocket quotes into the album. But we'd, we'd met with a bunch of record labels and just didn't feel not a bunch at that point, just one or two and still felt like, well, we, uh, I don't think we really need it. And we didn't meet anyone that we really felt was like interested in us being uh, a more robust version of ourselves. It was always like, you guys are great. Let's make you sound more like something that's already been successful. Mm -hmm. So we just held off and then you somewhere have... maybe on our third record, I think we, we did a distribution deal. We did like a, a P and D okay. deal. Or maybe, for, four, or maybe fourth record. I think because we were touring for a while and, and we would get, um, yeah, I don't think we really signed any, I would say it, would be, it was a while until we signed anything because we, they would give us like these plaques after selling out Roseland in New York city or whatever. And it would be like first unsigned band ever. Oh, wow. So you so guys it, were like really blowing up just as an independent band. It what, was where, where, where were you seeing like the, like when did the success start? Was it gradual or was it like a moment that you remember it kind of booming for you? I mean, you talked about Napster. I'd love to hear how that really helped you. It was all pretty, I mean, it, what's funny is we didn't realize how huge the trajectory was at the time okay. and how kind of, how, how it, how, what an anomaly it was. But at, at the time, it just seemed like, you know, every year we got a little bigger and it was, not, it was always the, the groundswell, you know, it was always from the bottom up because we were, we were not signed to a label. So there was never like radio or any kind of big marketing push. So it was just kind of a slow, you know, or not so slow rise, mm -hmm. and, but it was organic. I think that, that it was all word of mouth, like so, wow. some cousin or somebody's this to this and no one older than us knew about the band, but in certain circles or towns or cities, if you were our age or younger, you, you, you definitely knew about the band. The uh -huh. band. So it was, sure. like, it was a, this kind of secret. That's why, I, that's kind of like our our legend, if you will, is just like that where, you know, someone called us the biggest band you've never heard of after we did our big show in Boston on the on the Esplanade, our farewell show years ago, that, that brought out like hundred and ten thousand people. Oh my gosh! That, that was like the craziest thing in our career so far. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to get to that point. That's crazy. Um. Well, tell me about. You, did you guys finish school and then the band continues or the band kind of takes its own life at that point? Yeah, we I pretty much finished school. I did. Chad left. Pete finished, too. Yeah. But we took a semester off, I think, early on and kind of tried the touring idea. And um, all three of us amazingly had sets of parents that were really stoked that we loved what we were doing. So it's like. We wished we had that punk angst in our story, but really our parents were into what we were doing. Oh, that's cool though. <laughs> yeah, right. it was awesome. Um, but yeah, Boston and New York, we really focused in on playing the same, those two cities for three to five years. And it did like, it was kind of just like, okay, 50 people, 70 people, 100 people, 150. 
But when we got to about 600 or 800 in both Boston and New York, it's kind of like we pinged on industry radar somehow. And a booking agent or a lawyer came out and we're just like, hey, what you guys are doing is, is pretty compelling. Let us know if we can help build your team. And then when Napster hit, before we didn't even know what it was, but we were offered a college gig uh, in California. And we flew like through the night and our biggest show up to that point might have been downstairs at the Middle East playing two nights. So maybe a thousand tickets sold in Boston. Uh -huh. And there were like 1200 kids at this California college gig singing all of our lyrics. Wow. And we're like, we're getting punked right now. Like what is going on? <laughs> who, who set this up? And, and someone in student activities like, well, it's Napster. And I, I remember thinking that that was a student. I was like, who is Napster? Like this is <laughs> who is this kid? <laughs> we we got to give him some more free swag. This is yeah. incredible. And uh, th that was the beginning of us learning how, even though we weren't on radio, there was this like natural dam that broke, and then fans were finding music and sending it to each other. And man, it really helped us. We got to know Sean Fanning a little bit too because of all the controversy where he ended up in a court hearing in DC, and there were all these you know huge acts that were pissed off about their records being quote stolen and we right. were kind of on the other side of it going well we without we can't get on the radio without signing a record deal and we don't really want to do that but here he's giving us massive exposure and we're selling tickets so it can't be all bad right yeah you guys are on the other end of the that's why i was curious when you said the napster really helped you whereas you all you heard before was oh napster's you know destroying the music industry and nobody's making money and everyone's getting records for free but as a working yeah, band, they, you're selling more tickets. There's like a C-SPAN clip of, I think, Alanis Morissette, Don Henley, and I can't remember who else. Like Lars maybe Ulrich or something. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> main, maybe Lars. And then you see like the two of us, you know, kind of like <laughs> leaning, leaning around and looking at what's going on on the panel. It was wild. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. That was, that was at the congressional hearing and it was like us, Sean Fanning and Chuck D, you know, it was awesome. Yeah, it was. You guys epic. were on one side versus all them. Yeah. <laughs> you had we Chuck D on your side. Of war. That's yeah. dope. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so cool. Well, um, what was the college that you played? I'm, I'm just curious because I'm from California or something. Pomona. California. Oh, yeah. okay. Pomona. Yeah. One of those five schools. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, well, you have the, I mean, Southern California like soaks up the reggae, like that vibe of music. And it's just such a huge genre out there. That's, that's doesn't surprise me that they were kind of finding your music online and, and absorbing it through now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was a good, it was a good match. We also played a we battle of bands, right? Right before we played at Pomona. We, 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 we got second, I think, at, a, at <laughs> UCSD. Uh, which, is the, which is the first loser. UCSD, UCSD. The first, the first loser. We lost yeah. to DJ Frost. Oh, bro, you freaking <laughs> steel trap that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So when, okay, you guys are putting out records. I know that you went on a hiatus. Was that pretty soon after that? I mean, you put out quite a few records before the hiatus, right? fourth album was like 99 or 2000 we remember it well because we had finally gotten to record at bearsville studios like in upstate new york we'd always dreamed about getting into a really big space and it was incredible but it was also really uh, it was a pretty sad time and a pretty tense time chad's grandfather had passed away mm -hmm. somewhere in the midst of the recording and we were really close with him and we also weren't getting along great and had the first kind of uh Bruja on who was writing what song and you know like sure. band that was the first kind of earthquake i think that that put all three of us in a place where we're like man we got to be careful here or else we're going to be we're going to end up turning into one of those bands that does not enjoy anything about each other and mm -hmm. the whole process but it was the the record was called who are we living for and then we toured that for maybe a year or two and then went on a hiatus for a couple of years and then played that show in 2004 at the Esplanade in Boston. Wow. And how did you guys, like, how did that show come about? I'm just curious, like if you were like on a hiatus, did they approach you and say, Hey, like we got this really big thing we want you to be a part of. It was we just, 
Well, Go I, ahead. Well, it was, I remember I was, I think I was living in New York. No, I wasn't living in New York, but I, some, for some reason I was there. And one of, an old friend who was a manager, who is now our manager and was our manager back then. Uh, he was, he's like the Doogie Hauser of, um, of the, the record industries. He's like, we, we, he first started working with Bass when he was in high school. Wow. Um, and he was, I think he presented it to me like you guys, you guys never did a proper farewell to, cause, cause after that 2002 spring, mm -hmm. we, we were kind of like, that's it. Like just kind of wanted to hang up our cleats. Oh, you didn't do like a proper farewell. Like we're, we're right. going to do so a hiatus two, tour. Two years went by or a year and a half or something. And he came, he came to me and said, what do you, you know, like, I think you should do a proper farewell. And I think he probably did the same with Brad and Pete and, and, and cajoled us into talking and getting together and, and, and we decided to do it. Uh, you know, it was free and it was outside. Um, so it was kind of, a, it was a way to kind of, I don't know, mark, mark the band and kind of say, say goodbye. Wow. That was it like an, I must've been an emotional moment. I mean, play, I mean, especially for that big of a crowd. Wow. Like, you said 160,000 people. Oh, so it was wild. It was free. And we were sort of setting it up for like, let's see how far we'll give like a, a, a some sort of backstage hang to whoever comes from the, from the furthest distance, thinking that it was just going to be somewhere in the States. And we start getting emails from people saying like, I'm coming in from Portugal. I'm coming in from Italy. I'm coming in from, I remember we got one that said UAE. And I was like, I don't know what that is. So there were 29, 29 countries represented and we had all those folks backstage with us. And really, I think for the three of us had our eyes open to like this new era, this new era of, uh, you know, music just going wherever it can in a click. It was incredible. And then because the weather was so good, watching it go from, because it's a free show, so we don't have any idea how many people are going to show up with tickets. Right. And we got there day of for sound check at like I think noon or something like that, and there were already sixty thousand people there. Oh my! It was gosh. the most nerve wracking sound check ever. You like trying to uh, one, two, three, check, check. You know, like look yeah. at fifteen times or hundred times more people than you've ever seen before played for during sound check in your flip flops. And then we couldn't get back to the hotel to get closed. So we had to stay there. They closed the highway. So we stayed at the venue underneath. And by the time we started playing at like four o'clock ish, the state patrol was there. The, uh, they had some division patrolling the river. And then um, the people in like, riot squad gear came oh, in because like i guess the year before <laughs> yeah the year before green day had had a show there with ninety thousand people and people were like tearing up the turf or something so we're like holy shit what what is this but when we started playing it i mean it was oh, it was amazing looking out oh my gosh there i can't like even imagine two cops on on like because they didn't think it was going to be that big of a show so there was like two cops hired on, you know to detail the the concert <laughs> <laughs> 60,000 people the day before we're waiting like uh-oh we should probably call in a little backup here yeah oh, oh man. my gosh that is crazy and then you guys put out like a little documentary chronicling some of that early those like earlier lead-up days to the show we put up two documentaries one's called under the radar kind of about the early days of touring or not uh -huh. even early days, kind of the middle days, if you will. Uh, now they're pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then there's another documentary, I think called The Last Dispatch about yeah. the few days leading up to those show, that show. That, ma that made it cool too, because we really, we didn't know the filmer. His name's Helmut Schleppi, such a sweet, amazing soul. So we've got this random dude with a camera kind of following us as we're <laughs> trying to figure out what the show is going to be, how to enjoy it, how to not, you know, how to stay focused on the good stuff. And, and then this, like the anticipation, the reveal of what was the show going to be. And I remember Helmet had a really limited budget and at the last minute felt like he should get one of those jib cameras that would sort of be at like where the barricade mm, is for the yeah. stage because the, the hat shell is such a tall stage. And 
it was wild. I mean, if he hadn't had that, like the, the footage, the best footage from that experience was getting, cause this is pre drone. Sure. Oh, I so wish we had a drone back then to really <laughs> see how big the crowd was, but that jib camera, you know, like looking out at that swinging over the people and playing that show was there were people in the trees. At one point, Chad's like, this song's going out to the people in the trees. And <laughs> oh my gosh, that is oh, insane. It was epic. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, after that show, I mean, you guys had been on a high or on a hiatus right? like for a bit of time at that point, right? Was there like any after that show was it like, oh, we should maybe get back together? Or were you guys still kind of in the we'll, you know, see how this goes type phase? Do you remember? It didn't, I remember not feeling like I, I, it was a hard show to, it was hard in that, in that so many people seemed to care about the band. Right. Um, but it, it didn't feel like the riffs or the, the emotional relationships between the three of us did were, you know, weren't all cured up after a year and a half off from touring. Okay. Um, that, that took, that took more time. That took about, we ended the next time we played was 2007 and and you know which was three years later and and i think that felt a little better then mm-hmm. um but th- but that show was yeah it was very emotional we weren't sure if we would ever play again we weren't really planning on ever playing again and it was sad in that it's like you know kind of a breakup or, or relation right um, um and the fans started chanting at one point don't break up did they really? Ouch. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no. like, like a soccer stadium. Don't break up. Don't oh break up. Gosh. And we're like, oh, man. Wow. What an, Yeah, that I couldn't imagine being. That must have been so emotional having that happening. 160,000 well, people chant, telling you not to break up the band. Like, oh, uh, 07 was a great way for us to kind of get back at it and find the heart of it. Chad had spent some time in Zimbabwe. Uh, before we were a band but met a guy named alias there who was a really dear friend of his and chad penned a song that became one of our fan favorites called alias and in 2006 7 zimbabwe was i think it was the poorest country in the world and we were able to play madison square garden and do a dispatch zimbabwe event where we were trying to get people together obviously to play music but also show um jumbotron footage of how we could support organizations that were working oh, wow. you know working with all kinds of groups in zimbabwe and that was amazing we sold out three nights in the round wow and again kind of a first like first independent band to play there once and then twice and then three times and boy when we left that it was it was really sweet but i think we also just knew formationally each of us weren't ready to just come back because of a perceived moment of well, we could still be mm-hmm. successful and do this it was like good to see each other we missed each other a little bit and then and then 2011 is the first time where we were like okay it kind of sucks to rehearse for two weeks and play one gig <laughs> so so we we tried a you know a limited tour in 2011 and then you know from that point on the band has had a pretty consistent recording rhythm and mm-hmm. touring rhythm. But for Chad and I and our, our uh, other founding band member, Pete, 2011 to 2015 was gut wrenching because Pete was spiraling more and more with his uh, struggle with mental illness, just a lot of issues with depression. And mm-hmm. I mean, he was super courageous, but like we were just more and more of touring became how to protect Pete. Uh and how you know we could we didn't want to put him in front of our fans and have them wondering what's going on like it was just such a hard time we wanted to play and pete wanted to play but we were trying to be protective and cautious it was it was it was brutal so it led to uh pete essentially taking some time off from playing and then pete Mm -hmm. leaving the band and we've recorded four or five record four three or four records since then in starting wow. in 2016. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that must have been really tough. That's um I'm yeah, wow. Um I'm glad that he, he was able to get help. I mean, that's that's a good thing, but yeah, to be put yeah. through that kind of that yeah, I can't even imagine. Um well, we did you guys band therapy thing too. 
I'm sorry. The, the band Therapy. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually haven't seen that Metallica documentary yet. We gotta watch that. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I wanted to at the time, but now yeah, it would be interesting. Too close. Yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> no. Oh, but anyway, yeah, it was, it's been a, it's, you know, it's been a tricky road to navigate. Um, but it's, uh, but it, the, the last few years, uh, you know, we've been able to you know, bring, uh, bring other people into the band, not to necessarily mm -hmm. or Pete's shoes, but to just kind of bring us in, bring us to a different place sure and we miss playing with pete a lot um but he's doing some great solo stuff and it's amazing yeah and you do things on his own terms it was it different writing a record without him like the next album that you put out yeah in combination with us kind of being older and approaching the writing with less egos and more just like let's just choose the songs that we we all agree are the best songs and um, let's come together with a big batch of songs and whittle it down. And, and so we, we've, we've been much more since 2016, we've been much more intentional about the process and more proactive and probably just more grown up about it. Where in the past, it was kind of like, <laughs> I got this song. I got this song. You got this song. I got this song. Right. Got, Don't got, you got, touch my real estate. That guy, <laughs> go to the bathroom. Hey, Brad, let me show you this song. You know, I, I went to get a sweatshirt and, and, I came back and Pete and Brad, you know, years, years. Oh later, so. no! Ah, <laughs> it was like, it's all it's it really it boils down to your freaking bladder. Oh shit! <laughs> oh man! So, uh, yeah, so it's it, it's it's a bit of a different animal now, okay. um, but it's uh, but it's felt uh, aside from missing Pete, it's felt you know like we've. Um, it's, you know, I think it's, it's, it's felt like we've had the opportunity just to, I don't know, kind of lock into this new, um, new style or not necessarily new style, but new, new way of existing within the band. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in some ways, um, you know, been, been healthier than it, than it has been in the past. That's good. And with this old, with this pandemic, how did that really affect you guys? I mean, were you touring up until the, sh the whole world shut down last year? We, gosh, we're so fortunate that we had slotted January, Feb, February, I think. Uh, what what year was that, Chad? Is that 19 or 20? 20? 20. February of 20, we went in to record. Oh, and okay. So we did a full record thinking it would come out probably in May. And then we would tour starting in June mm -hmm. and push that tour and then push another year. So really the 2020 tour is now going to happen in 2022, mm -hmm. but we've been sitting on new songs uh, and a full album and just kind of releasing three songs at a time until at the end of this month, our, our we'll release the whole record. I think it's on May 28th. Um, so I'm grateful. I think Chad and I feel like at least there's a connection with our fans and with each other around the, you know, like these are new songs. We've been waiting mm -hmm. and waiting and waiting to release them. Um, and then we're looking at, you know, if it's safe doing a, a short run in the fall and then a fully blown tour next summer. Amazing. Amazing. Were, were these songs all written over the court or you recorded the whole record during that February era and then you guys have just kind of had those and were you writing new stuff throughout the course chad, of being stuck inside chad chad why don't you answer that because we did a couple with uh in boston yeah right connie connie and as old as i yeah even year of the woman that was all pre-pandemic um pre-february yeah so for me the pandemic has been has been uh brad and i have been able Thankfully, what we were allowed the time to properly finish the record, which and make it, I think, a much better record than it would have been if we just re, re, if we actually had a tour that last summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the record if we had just released the, what we had, it, maybe we would have chosen less songs or they would have. It was a little half baked, so we had 
we had the opportunity to get in uh, in Denver and Boston respect, respectfully and and finish you know certain tunes here and there and kind of uh the record at one point was going off in a direction that we felt was losing its soul a little bit so we had to kind of bring it back kind of um deconstruct some of the songs a little bit and try to find find the essence of those songs and then kind of make sh and then maybe add this or that and kind of rebuild them so some of the songs needed some some needed to hit the uh, operating room and we had the time to be able mm -hmm. to do that. So that was really helpful and, and, uh, you know, kept us, kept us pretty busy. Um, aside from that, I, I've, the pandemic for me has been mostly just like, uh, like, like my wife works full time. So I'm kind of home with the kids and it's like just a mad fucking circus every day. sure <laughs> i have two kids man i totally feel you <laughs> well, i'm just like trying to zoom school and all the other crap that's going yeah, on <laughs> yeah. I'm, just like, I'm just like making toast and like picking up shit off the floor all day sure <laughs> i dude i totally uh, relate to that oh man <laughs> Well, at least you guys got a record, you know, and that's, I talked to somebody, I've talked to a few artists that have had that similar story where the record was done and at least like, you know, you're at the mixing point or getting ready to kind of put it, the finishing touches on it and then the pandemic hits and you kind of have a little bit more time to sit with it and tweak certain things that, or maybe add parts. Do you feel like that was kind of or, you... or maybe a little too much time at one uh, point. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So it, it is good that uh, I just can't quite imagine if we had like slotted March or April to record, mm -hmm. how that would feel to have this pipeline of material kind of stuck that yeah. you may not be fully connected with by the time you could get in to record it. So just super grateful that like yeah. the timing landed while the songs were mm -hmm. fresh and then we were able to retool like chad said and and honestly nothing we were we thought we would do probably 11 or 12 songs but we ended up doing 15 because we had the time and energy to uh to fix everything mm -hmm. um <laughs> so now i think the challenge is just <laughs> i think we confuse the shit out of ourselves and our fans the way we were releasing <laughs> the songs we were trying to do at one point they were called phases, then pods, then chapters, then batches, whatever they were. They were three song chunks, what we'll call them chunks. And people are like, oh, you guys released another EP? And we're like, no, no, we're not doing EPs. We're just, this is an album, but all right, fuck it. Here, the whole album's coming out at the end of this month. Yeah, I, I love how you have it on Spotify where it's, it's just in brackets that says in progress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was our fix. That was oh, to try okay. to fix the shit. So, yeah. <laughs> it's clever, my, though. I'll give you that. My wife is listens on Apple Music, and she was pissed at me. She's like, do you understand? I have to click on every one of your songs as a single and you've got seven and there's no place on Apple to pull them together. So then Chad and I get our managers on and they're like, uh, we, uh, uh Apple music does something different than Spotify does. And we were just like, what have we done? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> confusing everybody. <laughs> yeah. Where well, the are whole, these little the, creatures? Well, the full record will be out here in what, a couple of weeks, you said the end of the month. Yes. And then um, thank you. Hopefully there's no confusion at that point. <laughs> there you go. It's a 15 song EP. 15 song EP. <laughs> well, and I did see that you guys are booked for at least the Freshgrass Festival, which is coming in September. That must be cool to kind of see some light at the end of this and a yeah. show on the books. Yeah. yeah. That'll be an emotional day. I can only imagine, you know, getting back up on stage for the first time. And yeah, you know, it really will. Years. It's going to be, uh, I know I can't even imagine the crowds in the situation. Like when, when people are actually able to, to do this and when, when the live music is going, I think people are really going to appreciate it quite a bit more than, <laughs> than in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, such what a, what a time this has been. Yeah. You guys are doing that acoustic. Yeah. Do you enjoy the acoustic songs or, or like doing stuff stripped back like that? It's, you know, I mean, that's, it's, Oh, go ahead, Chatty. No, you go ahead. I think because we love harmony so much and we love kind of the bones of 
songs. I mean, still like listening to demos of albums from the 60s and 70s, like to be able to play a song just with one guitar and a stack of harmonies and a shaker, if, if you can make it feel alive in that setting, then, if, then the thought is like, well, it, then it can also live electric. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think because that's where we started 25 ish years ago, it was just around a couple of guitars and shakers, not knowing how to play any other instruments. We still really appreciate it. And we did one acoustic tour, a winter tour in 2017, but kind of made it a hybrid where there was like plugged in bass and keys and a little trap kit. But this this particular show, and hopefully if we can tour some this fall, we just really want it to be like two guitars and maybe a you know djembe or, or conga drum and call it good. Wow, that'll be inter- that'll be cool. That's really awesome. Might be. <laughs> it might be we'll see yeah well, we'll see a, i mean you're, yeah that's exciting though at least you know a tour possibly and you've got a show in the books and yeah. things are opening up good stuff well thank you both so much for doing this i really appreciate it yeah man thank you good yeah, do, good to be chatting it up yeah i do have one more question for the both of you i want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists just play play for your dog, play for your family, play for a senior center, play, just play. I mean, I think, I think it's heart oriented. I think if you play because you love music, eventually your audience comes. And I think if you are playing only for the sake of having an audience, sometimes you just lose your way. So I'd say just keep your heart as your guide and just play. I love it. Yeah. I think just sit like, like busking, you know, just play out on the streets, play for pizza, play, just get yourself out there. Uh, you know, and uh, we got Cosmic uh, Cantina. When we got an old, when we got a, we got a, we bought an old van and, you know, that was just like a, such a dream to, to really be on tour. Um, but we, yeah, you just, you, you know, we were do, playing like high schools and proms and VFW halls and community centers, you know, just really <laughs> random stuff. So that's, but, but we were, you know, when you, cause no one helps, it's so like, I would recommend not going for like the pie in the sky, but just starting at that on the ground and, and just, and, you know, I'm sure kids these days try to try to just like, they want to just make it big on YouTube or something, but it's probably such a rare percentage that actually does that. So, so the old fashioned way is just to get out there and, and get in front of people. Bring it back. Thank you.